Hello, my name is Tom Moore. I'm a writer in St. John's, Newfoundland. I would like to read you a story that will help pass the time when we're all in this personal isolation business. It's called The Rat, but it's really about the relationship between the father and the son. In Avondale, we had a general store selling groceries, coal, flour, oats, everything people needed to live before supermarkets. We weren't the biggest store in town, but we worked hard and we made a living. Rats were a problem every winter. In our sheds we had big sacks of oats and white flour. A rat would cut a hole in the corner of the sack and half the flour would pour out on the floor. Lost. In the summer, rats would forage in the fields. But when the land froze and snow covered the ground, rats needed shelter. Our storage sheds were the perfect solution for a cold, hungry rat. My father was an excellent rat catcher. Cunning, patient, father lived in his own head. You talked to him and he looked at you and you thought he was listening, but his mind was elsewhere, often on rats. I would follow him into the flower store and see white flour, the lifeblood of our business, drained out on the dirty planks. Father touched the cloth bag, the jagged tear, the spilled flour. He reached up and turned on the naked little bulb with a gentle twist of his hand. Down on his knees, he found one paw print in the powder, then another. Like a forensic scientist, he followed the tracks along the wall to find the rat's hole. Father was not bitter toward the rat, just determined. Face set, with a bead of spittle on his chin and his tongue nipped out between his front teeth. He caught 26 rats and a mink one winter. A tidy above-ground shed lead covered the entrance to our root cellar. A wooden hatch lifted up and with it came the musky smell of potatoes, carrots, turnips, parsnips sleeping in their bins below. It was a world of hibernation, like the secret dens of field mice and weasels trying to survive below the frost line and rats raising their broods under the snow. A small ladder was the only entrance down to our cellar, but the rats seemed to find their own way in. Every Wednesday the shop would close at noon, an old Newfoundland tradition that allowed father to drive to St. John's for supplies. He visited Harrison Hiscox, Steers, and other wholesalers along Water Street. Some of them had been doing business there for centuries as ships came to their wharves from, with goods from Boston, New York, and London. On Wednesdays, I was left in charge. Mother would be in the store tallying bills, so it was my responsibility to count the bags of oats, flour, delivered by the big trucks from Spaniards Bay and Harbor Grace. I was 11 years old and trusted with these simple tasks when no adult was available. One Wednesday, Father took me aside before he left. I want you to check the rat traps every hour or so. If I catch him, I don't want him to get away. He walked to the truck, but stopped at the door and looked back at me. Don't forget. I had seen Father set the three big steel beaver traps in the wooden box and covered them with sawdust and flour. Deadly jaws with the serrated teeth they lay hidden under the delicate powder. Father wore cotton gloves when he set his traps. He placed the gloves in our manure pit for a week to cover up any human scent. He believed that his stinky gloves hid him from the rats. And this trick seemed to work because he cut dozens of rats each winter. So, he was gone, and I was the new rat catcher. 
I hated to climb down that little ladder with my face tight to the wet wall and my back to any rats or demons that may be in the cellar. The light bulb was down there, so I had to descend into the darkness before I could turn on the light. I was also encumbered by thick winter clothes and clumsy boots. I didn't check those traps all day. Eventually, though, just before dark, I went down in search of rats, which I hoped had escaped. By then, Father was on his way home from St. John's with his truck loaded with supplies. I took out my woolen mitts to better grasp the ladder. My foot landed on the soft floor, and my hand reached for the bulb, which flooded the little cell with white light. There was no sound from the box, so I leaned over it to check. Suddenly the wooden box exploded with all the energies of the poor animal entrapped there. A cacophony of clanging steel traps and the chain links that bound them to the box. A big rat had cut a paw in one trap and then set off the other two as he thrashed around in the dark. The cold steel of the beaver traps showed no pity, even in the face of his ferocity. I fell back against the ladder, but my young mind was forming a plan even before the fear and nausea abated. I put on my mitts. The rats stopped thrashing. I looked up at the small hatch above my head and wondered how I could bring rat, box, and me back up into the world. I could not grab the box because his angry teeth were still lethal. So I tipped the box on one side and I got my hand under it, then grasped the bottom of the box with two hands. Now the trick was to hold the box and the ladder at the same time. I slowly placed the box on my head, holding it with one hand and edging towards the ladder. My thick winter cap muffled any noise from the traps, but my rat was quiet now, tuckered out, perhaps in shock from his agony. I had one hand on the box and the other on the ladder. As I rose from the grave, rung after careful rung, when my head emerged into the faint daylight still there, I slid the box onto the wooden floor. Then I went down and turned off the light, and came back up and replaced the hatch cover. My mind was deathly calm. As I did these things, just like I thought an adult would do. Then I studied my rat, pinioned by the cruel steel traps. Father killed rats with a wooden stick about four feet long, which he placed on their neck, and then he pushed till they were dead. But I left my rat, and I walked out into the yard. The familiar winter scene swept over me, and for a second the ugly rat was gone, and I was a boy again. Someone shouted my name from the road, but I didn't even look to see who it was. I went into the house, winter boots still on. Our domestic help, Kelly, was washing dishes at the sink. I ignored her look and question, and I walked across the kitchen floor. I went into my bedroom, and from my closet, I took my Cooey 22 caliber rifle and just one bullet from the bureau, short range, brass casing, slightly oiled, gray slug. My heart was calm, my mind was clear as I closed the bureau drawer. In the mirror, I saw my face, a stranger's face, determined his tongue nipped between his front teeth. I carried the gun low by my leg so no one would notice as I walked back across the yard. The rat was where I left him. I put my boot behind the box and I slid it out through the cellar door onto the cold ground because I didn't want my bullet to go through the floor. 
I loaded the gun, cocked it, and pointed the steel barrel into the box. Just then, the rat twisted away from the gun, and I shot my bullet into the back of his little head. The slug went through the base of his skull, down through the wooden box, into the ground. No bang. The sound of a twenty-two is a small thud. And off he went to rat heaven with flour and potatoes for all. Father came home and we started unloading the truck. Did you check the traps? Yes, I got them, I said. Father froze. I remember he was lifting a bag of oats to his shoulder, but he stopped and he laid it back on the truck. Show me. It was dark now, but we could see the box, the traps, and the rat. Father didn't know what to say. I saw him glancing at me as one would appraise a stranger. How'd you kill him? I used my twenty-two. He didn't say a word, but I knew a lot of cogs were spinning in his head. He looked down at the rat and lifted a trap by the chain. We could see the neat round hole in the back of his head. Did anyone hear you shoot? No. Nope. Good job, son, would be the normal response if this were a TV show. But instead he said, big fella, and looked at the rat. This comment did not invite a reply, so I gave none. Big fella, he said again, as he dropped the rat and traps back into the box with a clang. My twenty-two was propped against the door. We were in uncharted waters now, almost like one man talking to another man. Then he offered a comment which we both knew was insincere. I see you didn't reset the traps, he said. No, I didn't, I said, with no apology. He went back to unloading the truck. Big hundred pound bags were too heavy for me, so I brought over my gun and I waited till he finished. Then he closed the big flower store door with a slam and clicked shut the Yale lock. He got into his truck and the cab lit up when he turned on the ignition. The door was still open and he leaned out into the dark and said to me, one shot? One shot was all I said. He shut the truck door and drove over to the garage. I went back to the cellar and stood for a while with the gun in my hand and the rat in his box at my feet. I kicked it to hear the chains jangle deep, deep below me, the huge tectonic plates of the earth's crust were shifting. High above my head, the winter stars twinkled in the silent vacuum of space. Orion the hunter chased his hounds across the sky. Night. But something was different now between father and me, and I knew it was more than a rat.